So uh, that was pretty much the perfect setup. I feel like James basically gave uh, part of the first half of my talk, which means I can focus on what I do and, uh, and how what we do is beyond traditional charity and give you a good example of this new wave of social impact business. Uh, so I, uh, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about how I got here today. Uh, I started off doing this work in Africa when I was 17. A scholarship from a big tobacco company sent me to rural Ghana. I convinced my high school guidance counselor to let me use this money from Big Tobacco to go and do essentially a gap year, a gap six months in what would have been the second semester of my senior year of high school. So I showed up in Ghana thinking like most optimistic young people that I would go and I would save all of these poor kids in Africa. And I showed up there, I was assigned to teach at a school for the blind. And I was amazed to discover that my students could name US senators they listened to Voice of America and BBC Radio, they spoke beautiful English, and they were perfectly capable of helping themselves. And what I learned is that they were poor because of an accident of birth. They were poor because they happened to be born in a country where the labor markets were not strong, where the biggest industry was in the informal economy, and where the only jobs available were things like picking up trash by the side of the road to sell it to the local recycler, or doing various other things in the informal economy, making less than about a dollar a day. So my mindset shifted during this period from let me go and give poor people free stuff and benefits to let me figure out how I can empower them because this traditional model of aid is not working, it's very broken. So I stumbled into this idea of giving work. And over the years, I worked for the World Bank, I worked for many different NGOs, and I realized that the greatest challenge was that low-income people lacked access to work, that the aid model was locking them into a cycle of dependency. We've spent a trillion dollars on aid-related interventions in sub-Saharan Africa in the last 50 or 50, uh, 60 years, and we haven't seen much improvement. The people at the very bottom have stagnated, in fact. And the reason for that is that a lot of our aid is targeting essentially giving people free stuff, giving them free goods and services, building them schools, building them wells, building some infrastructure. And what low-income people most want if you talk to them, and I've spent now uh, over a decade talking to people who make less than $2 a day, in some cases living near them in their villages, and learning from them. And, and what you hear overwhelmingly is, we want work. Give us work. It's wonderful that you're building this dam or this well or this school, but what would really help is work. Because work gives people income, and income equates to agency. If you think about it, if you give people free stuff, they're, they're completely prevented from exercising the sort of agency that you and I enjoy. They don't pay taxes to the government, and therefore the government feels no responsibility to them. They don't have the ability to put that cash where they see fit, to put that cash into the sorts of benefits that they really want to enjoy. So this idea of giving work, which seems so obvious in the private sector, is still really new in the nonprofit sector, and it's just starting to come up uh, in this new field of social enterprise, which I'll describe in a moment, which is what we do at my organization. So in, uh, in 2008, I got really frustrated with the traditional aid model. I had gone to work for a management consulting firm and wanted to learn about how to start a business that would employ many low-income people and give work. And uh, this was the rise of the outsourcing era. Tom Friedman had written his book, The World is Flat. And for the first time, we realized that we could connect to labor markets in far-flung locations, that people like the parents of my children that I taught in Ghana could, for the first time, work for big companies outside of Ghana. For the first time, people were not constrained by the accident of birth to only working close to where they live. Because of the internet economy, people can now work for companies that are far away from where they happen to be born. And this is a fundamental enabler. I think that the biggest challenge in capitalism today is that money can move freely across borders, but labor cannot, right? And we see this in Europe with the migration crisis. We see this across the world. Uh, poor people are fleeing usually because of economic hardship, right? So theoretically, the internet can cross this divide, can enable low-income people to benefit for the first time from opportunities in wealthier countries. And that's the core idea behind uh, SamaSource, which I founded in 2008. We connect the world's poorest people to work over the internet that pays them a living wage. 
And uh, to give you an idea of the sorts of customers that are interested in this type of work, we have worked with some of Silicon Valley's top clients since 2008. Uh, companies like Google and Walmart.com and Getty Images. And what we found, similar to what James was just saying, is that they will hire us not out of charity or because uh, we're giving work to low-income people. They'll hire us because we do great quality work. It turns out that when you hire people who've never had a chance before, who've never had the ability to have formal employment, they take their jobs extremely seriously. And so even if they're doing really basic tasks, which is what we train them to do, they're incredibly motivated to do very well at these tasks. And so as a result, we've been able to amass a large number of, of Silicon Valley clients. Since we've started, we've performed over 200 million tasks, um, completed over 200 projects, and paid out over $10 million in cash to low-income people. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what this looks like at the human level. And I think this translates to this broader vision of social good that we're talking about today, of getting beyond traditional charity. And I'm going to try to make you the case uh, for why it makes more sense to invest in models that give work than to invest in traditional charity that gives away free stuff. So we've now moved about 35,000 people, a little bit more than it says up here, from $2 a day to well over $8 a day through this giving work model, about 7,000 workers and their families. And, uh, and to put that in individual terms, what does it look like to live on roughly $2 a day? This is where most of the people that we hire are starting from. It means that you're living a life of squalor. You're living in unsafe housing, typically in a slum or in a rural area without access to electricity or uh, in many cases, even a reliable, um, a reliable source of water or sanitation at home. It means that you have very poor nutrition. Most of our workers in Nairobi, in the main city uh, in Kenya where we have uh, our work center, are eating sugar cane as the primary source of calories before they start working for us. It's the cheapest way to get nutrition. They have very limited educational opportunities. Even if schooling is free, they can't afford textbooks or uniforms. And they have uh, really inadequate health care. So no public hospitals in a lot of these countries and, uh, and no access to, to formal health care. Uh, after taking a job with us, and, and this is a model I think that could be applied to many other uh, settings in many other organizations, this idea of giving work. So it's not just Sama that does this, but we see this in some microfinance programs and we see this really powerfully now in many fair trade companies. There's a pretty dramatic uh, increase in income and, and in our case, we take people from $2 a day to over $8 a day. So that fourfold increase in income results in a dramatic shift in quality of life. We see people moving out of the slum. Um, for the first time, they're getting into secure housing, which immediately reduces their risk of various diseases and of violence dramatically. We see them eating healthier food. They start purchasing fruits and vegetables and protein. We see them getting access to higher education. Most of them save for uh, some kind of post-high school education for themselves, and they're able to pay school fees, uniforms, and books for younger children in the family. And lastly, healthcare access. Now, why is this interesting? Why am I sharing this with you? Well, what we see is that by giving people work, they buy for themselves the very things that we might want to give them for free through the charity model, right? A lot of the aid sector is focused on providing people these types of services on a one-off basis. Isn't it better if they can pay for these services themselves? If they can earn an income, pay some tax money into the government system, which thereby creates a relationship between the government and its people, even a theoretical one, a social contract. And importantly, they can start building up the infrastructure for themselves and their own communities. When they start purchasing healthier food, they create a market for more of that food to be distributed to them. When they start purchasing middle-income housing, they create a market for developers to come and build lower-cost, affordable housing for people coming out of the slum. So again, all of these things seem pretty intuitive in the private sector, but this is really new in the nonprofit sector where we've been locked into this idea that the best way to help people is to give them free stuff. Uh, just to put this in human terms, I wanted to share the story of Ken Kihara, one of our workers who started with us about two and a half years ago. So this is Ken outside of his home in the slum. Uh, he 
grew up in Mathare, which is one of the poorest communities in Kenya, on about a dollar a day, and he was orphaned when he was 10. His mother and seven of her nine siblings died of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis. And I mention this not to depress you, but just to show you that this is the reality for the roughly one billion people who live in slums globally, people who would benefit from models like Sama, models that give work, as opposed to just give handouts or free stuff. So Ken stumbled into a local computer lab um, that we had built in Mathare, and he got there because he was really frustrated. He had finished high school. He'd actually gone to one of the best boarding schools in Kenya on a scholarship. And he'd been forced to move back into the slum because there were no jobs for people with just a high school education. He needed to get into college. And yet there are no student loans that people like Ken can access. So he goes back to the slum to start working and saving money. And in order to make money, he started working as a recycler, which is the job that he had before. So he would wade through this filthy river, it's called Mathari River, pick up bits of trash, and uh, sell bits of metal that he would find to the local recycler for about $1.50 a day. This is what someone with a high school education who can read and write beautiful English was forced to do. And again, this is the reality not just for Ken, but for roughly a billion people who are living on this income level globally. Ken uh, stumbled into a computer lab, which we partner with, on the edge of Mathare, which is teaching computer classes, and started learning how to do basic tasks. Things like tagging images, capturing bits of data, categorizing data for data entry projects. And uh, Ken got hired by us a couple of months later. And now he's been working with Sama for about a year and a half. He moved out of the slum. He now pays for his young daughter to go to an excellent school in a community just outside of Mathare, but that's safer and that doesn't subject her to slum conditions. And Ken is now being employed, uh, because he's been so great, uh, as a trainer back in Mathare. So he's recruiting other people to move out of poverty through this model. He's done work for companies like Getty Images and Microsoft, all through this micro-work model that we've set up with Sama. And most importantly, I think when you talk to Ken, you see this transformation in the way he sees his own life. He sees that because of the dignity of work, he's capable of contributing something. He's not just a victim. He's not just somebody who can receive handouts. This is the most powerful thing that we can do to end global poverty, not to give people free stuff, but to give them hope and dignity by giving them work. This model works not only in the developing world. This is an image of a man named Gary uh, in his, outside of his trailer in rural Arkansas, which is in the Mississippi River Delta region of the United States in the rural south. As you all probably know, uh, we're facing a huge economic divide in the United States right now. There's a, a widening gap between the rich and the poor. And uh, low-income people in the U.S. are often more disconnected than people in developing countries. I was shocked to learn that in Gary's community, the internet and even the cell phone service is so bad that uh, a lot of these workers were ineligible to do traditional types of internet-based work until we went in and lobbied for better infrastructure and got them better internet connectivity in their homes. So even in parts of the developed world, we see a need for this model of giving work, uh, and we see a digital divide. So Gary is a military veteran. He, um, he worked in a factory. And as we've seen across the Western world, across the developed world, many of the traditional types of jobs that people were doing are either offshored or are automated. So Gary worked in a pet food factory, a dog food factory, and it closed down and moved to China. And Gary and about 100 other people were put out of work. Gary was desperate to find something else to do. He found a job, but it was two hours away, driving each way, and he realized he just couldn't afford the, the fuel costs going back and forth. So he was stuck at home in his trailer in rural Arkansas. Well, we set up a program, a pilot program initially, now it's scaling up, in a rural community in the US to see if what we did in Africa and Asia could work domestically in our own country. And amazingly, we found that it did. Gary enrolled in a program called Sama School. It's available for free to anyone at samaschool.org. We have 15,000 people currently enrolled today. And Sama School trains low-income people to benefit from the digital economy by training them to take on jobs like virtual call center agents um, and doing other types of virtual work through websites like Upwork. 
the new gig economy platforms, both for local work that can be done in a given city and for work that can be done online. Gary now works from home as a virtual call center operator, making $3 an hour more than he did at the dog food factory, but without having to leave his house. And while some of us might not find this work particularly enjoyable or satisfying, Gary said it's amazing for him to be able to stay in his local community, care for his aging relatives, not have to travel or, or move to a different city, and still be able to have dignified work that pays him a living wage. So this model of internet-based work, I think, is really transformative. It's a model that transcends the traditional idea of charity by giving people access to income that they can use to fund their own goods and services, and by giving them hope and dignity. It's a model that works not only in the developing world and in places like slums in Kenya or rural parts of Uganda or India where we work, but also uh, here at home in the developed world. I think it's a model that has tremendous potential for refugee communities. We're now doing a pilot in a refugee camp in Kenya called Dadaab, which is on the border of Kenya and Somalia. About 800,000 mostly Somali refugees have been living there for 20 years. It's a destitute place. Imagine what this could do for uh, the camps that house Syrian refugees that are mostly leaving because they need economic opportunity. If you ask any refugee, we've, we've done extensive surveying, the number one request they have is for dignified work, is for a way to earn a living and send money to relatives who are stuck back home, or earn a living and care for their relatives who are living in the camp. This model could be tremendously beneficial for, for refugee populations as well. So um, I'm going to open it up to questions. I think I have three and a half minutes left, and I would love to hear from the audience if there are any questions on this idea of, of giving work and transcending traditional charity. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs>